Um, I'm Christopher Meeks, and this is 40 minutes, it goes really fast, so I'm going to give you a five minute overview, overview on the subject, and then I'm going to have the rest of the panel speak. Let me introduce them. Uh, Rebecca Forster, over here to my right, is the author of 24 novels, including Keeping Counsel, and a series of books called Silent Witness and Hostile Witness. She's a USA Today best-selling author, and her most recent book, Privileged Witness, uh, debuted on the Barnes & Noble top seller list. She's now exclusively e-publishing, which I find interesting. And she's going to talk about the pros and the cons of, of self-publishing and traditional publishing. Uh, Eden, over to my left here. Did I say that? Eden. Eden. Eden, like a nice place to go. Uh, <laughs> Her work has appeared in McSweeney's, the LA Times Magazine, Narrative Magazine, Meridian, LA uh, Review, and last week she had a, a most interesting essay that was, was tweeted a lot, it was, it was all around the internet about putting out her, her agent sent her book to a lot of publishers and it got turned down and the feeling of having nowhere to go. I'm sad. Um, on the, positive side, on the positive side, three publishers came to her after her thing ran, so that shows you the power of a good of a good blog. And Mark, to my right, uh, is at least I know him really well from his uh, his blog, The Elegant Variation, which is probably the number one in the world, uh, literary wise. Uh, and he's the author of Harry Revised, which is a finalist for the Southern California Independent Booksellers Association. Uh, his reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Three Penny Review, and Barnes & Noble Review, among others. He says he's a contrarian, so uh, he's going to give you an extra angle on this whole issue. Uh, by the way, as I said, 40 minutes goes quickly. I will be teaching a whole one-day seminar uh, on October 22nd that runs from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on this subject. So you probably have a lot of questions. We're going to take five minutes each and then we'll save time for some questions. It won't all be answered in a day, but you'll at least get a flavor of this. And to keep me on schedule, I created a, a PowerPoint. Uh, so this is a this this first point is a point that maybe not everyone wants to hear, but it's certainly one that we who teach see a lot of. That is, you have to write a great novel or a short story before you get it published. And too many people go too early. Now, I have the approach. Many of my co you know, people who I work with believe that there is no bad first draft, right? A shitty first draft. But don't show us that. Don't try to send that out. You know, you feel so good after you, you, you've, you've done it, you think it's brilliant. Don't post it on your blog. Don't <laughs> post it on your blog. Oh. Uh, so there are things. You can take classes here, certainly one way. Find a mentor, join a writing group. Uh, and then even after you think it's nearly there, you've got to polish it and send it around some more. Uh, hire an editor. That's what's happening more and more. Even when you, when you, you get a, a publisher, a big publisher, they hardly do any editing anymore. And, and so you have to sort of send it perfectly. Uh, all right, there's two routes as you, you've gathered. Self-publishing, traditional publishing. Let me quickly go over traditional publishing first. Uh, you find an agent. Finding an agent is probably a whole quarter class in itself. There's, there's a lot of things to it. Get referrals from published friends is probably one of the best ways. <laughs> Write a killer query letter. It works. And when I say killer query letter, is you don't just write a letter and send it off. You show it to a lot of people and say, if you were super busy and you got this letter, would you pause and, and want to reach for the manuscript or the sample of the manuscript. And most people, again, send that too early and they get no responses. Don't send it to more than 10 agents at a time. 
If you don't get any response from those 10, it's possible your killer letter wasn't a killer letter. <laughs> then you readapt. So many people just send these you know, blanket things to everyone that they can find, and then they have nowhere else to go. Also, uh, I have a couple aging friends at this point, and one told me recently the thing he can't stand is getting a letter that looks as if it's gone to every agent around. There's nothing personal in there. So one of the secrets is to make each letter unique, or at least partly unique, something personal there. Uh, and then, ideally, if you get a few responses, then you can choose among agents. The agent then sends the manuscript to publishing house editors, <coughs> and then you have to wait and hear from that. If the publishing house agrees to publishing your work, they give you an advance, usually a third of an advance, because there's little steps going along the way. Then you have to rewrite for an editor, and once that editor accepts your final manuscript, it's still 12 to 24 months until you get published. That's because there's a lot of marketing stuff going on. Uh, and near the time of the publication date, the publishing house will send out advanced reading copies. Those are galleys. And edit, uh, reviewers then see those and hopefully review your book. That's a whole other aspect. How do you get your book reviewed? Uh, all right. Self-publishing. Now here's the, the main thing is so many people rush to publish. They've got their, their nephew says, this is really good. Yeah, really good. <laughs> Can I say that again? And then you're like, all right. You go to uh, Lulu or iUniverse or something. And it looks so fun and easy because you, you, you upload your, menu, uh, your Microsoft Word document and your cover. And if you don't have a cover, it helps you make the cover, which if you're making your own cover, might as well shoot your, your feet at the same time. Uh, you know, you don't want to look amateurish. But this is what a lot of people do. They rush in, they're an amateur, and it, it just looks like it. Uh, research your marketing options. There's a lot there. It could be an hour. Uh, one of the things, though, is to create a plan for yourself. What is it you're going to do? And one of the things you should do is echo what the big publishers do. Choose a publishing date at least three months away. Send out advanced reading copies. Trying to get uh, reviews. Uh, one of your big choices when you self publish is are you going to have a printed book, an ebook, or both? In the self publishing world, the ebooks are the easiest and the, the most doable. Uh, getting into the bookstore is very difficult, which uh, I won't take time to explain why, but there's a reason. Uh, and here's my last slide. The main requirement with, with uh, self-publishing is patience. Uh, patience all along the way. Patience in, in getting a, that manuscript that's really polished. Patience in, in having an editor and a few proofreaders until you have that, that copy. Patience in uh, alerting the world. People think, oh, you just tweet a few times, get on Facebook and tell people, bye, bye, bye. People don't like hearing that. They don't like the hard sale. Uh, that is some of the, the things you do in marketing. And also, if you have money, then you can hire publicists or author buzz is my latest thing. I think they're a good group. Uh, law tours and a lot more. All right, that's pretty brief. But you got the, the two notions, traditional publishing, which I highly recommend before self-publishing, and then self-publishing if you're, if, if you have that entrepreneurial spirit. It's a whole different hat to wear than, than being a writer, and most writers aren't the best business people. Uh, and now I want to turn to Rebecca oh, and uh, explain your, your two views. Explain my life. Um, I've been writing for 26 years, and I 
actually worked in business before I became a writer. Uh, I have my MBA and thought I would die in a corporate situation, and instead I spend my day talking to imaginary people and typing up their conversation. <laughs> So I'm not so sure what that MBA has done for me, except for the fact that it has allowed me to look at publishing through very different eyes. Um, because I did not come at publishing, I started writing because somebody dared me to write a book. My client was married to a very, very well-known author. And uh, after meeting her, I said that statement that we've all said, I could do that. And so I was dared to do it. And I approached it quite differently. I had never kept journals. I had never wanted really to be a writer. Um, I wanted to know how do you sell a product to New York. Now, this was my first try at this, and amazingly, my first book sold. I was I was very surprised. But I did a lot of analysis of how you approach the publisher, how you wrote a book, and pretty much followed sort of a, a game plan. Um, about my fifth book, it became an absolute overriding passion to understand the craft. And I stopped introducing myself as someone who worked plus wrote and started introducing myself as a writer. So um, I published 23 books actually with uh, the New York publishers, Penguin Putnam, Pocket Books, Harper's. Um, enjoyable, wonderful experience. I learned a ton. I learned that you have to have a very professional product. I learned my craft from the editors who took the time to teach me, sometimes from agents, but mostly from editors. Um, about 18 months ago, I made a, a business decision, and I switched completely over to digital publishing. Your craft remains the same. In fact, it's even more important that you put out a good product if you're going straight into digital publishing. People out there are respond to your work instantaneously. And if it's bad, full of typos, not edited, believe me, it's a kiss of death, and you will not sell another book digitally. However, for me, it's been great, um, because I realized it was a business decision, and I approached it as such. I uploaded some of my backlist. I wrote new books for digital. I now have four books on the Kindle legal thriller bestseller list for 18 months. I have two on the thriller bestseller list. Um, and it is because the product was good. The product was what someone would get on their Kindle is what someone would get in a bookstore. I can't stress it enough that you have to go out with a really well-edited book. Um, the reason I went digital was because my contract started coming with a lovely little line in it that said, you are signing over your rights to media now and not yet invented. <laughs> it's been in film contracts for years. That's a classic. Yes, or throughout the known universe. So whatever they're doing on and Alpha Centauri. Well, <laughs> and it does freak a lot of people out. It's not legal. You cannot sign away your rights to something that is not yet invented that you don't understand. So, I just, it bothered me. Then we came to the point where uh, the publishing houses were wanting 75% of your digital books, 75% uh, of your your royalties from digital books. And I thought, you know, I, I maybe I've reached a point in my career where I really wanted to strike out on my own and see what I can do. So I have done that. I no longer have the 24-month waiting period for publication. I am not saying that, that it wasn't easier for me because I had some name recognition. But there's also John Locke, who is an unknown. He was a marketing guy. He wrote four books. And he is the first Kindle million dollar seller, or million book seller. Just sold a million books. And then there is uh, the gentleman, Rick Mercer, who wrote Caribbean Moon. These guys work really hard. I'm telling you, this is 24 7 work. But you are in control of your own destiny, and I love that. And I get paid every month, and I love that. Um, but there are good and bad things. I would love to go back to traditional publishing. I just see that the future is digital, and it concerns me that somebody would own the rights for so long to my work. And maybe if I was 20, it would be different, but I'm not. And so I want to make sure I sort of have my, my rights house in order. Um, but because I've done both, I, I love both of them. I think digital is more time consuming and tiring and difficult in some ways, but it's also rewarding in ways you didn't get traditionally. But I am a commercial fiction writer. And you know we have literary fiction, which is a whole different follow-back. So 
I will turn it over to you. That's, that's what I'm discovering. It's, a, it's, a, it's di difficult literary either way these days, yeah. traditional or this way. But I'm before going to that, I'm going to go to my other two panelists. Eva? Um, I have a couple things to say. Um, I think this is really fascinating to hear these thoughts. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, small press publishing is also an option, that sometimes we think there's either the behemoth publishing houses in New York or there's self-publishing, but there are a lot of really fantastic small presses out there um, that are run out of, you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota, <laughs> like Ray Wolf Press and things like that, where they're, they're pretty great. You don't necessarily need an agent. Um, you still often do. Um, you still get an editor. They're still a marketing person. Um, and they are more flexible because they're smaller. I had my novella um, put out by a press called Flatman Crooked, um, and they did a launch where there was a first edition. There were only 400 copies, and they did a sort of like, you can buy it between these five days, and that's it. And they sold out in two and a half days, I think. So little things like that, where there's a flexibility in the small press market that might not be there for larger right. houses. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, publishing short stories, if there are any short story writers out there in the audience. Um, I think the way to go about doing that is to read a lot of short stories and write a lot before you submit. Um, and to start reading literary magazines and to look at um, websites like The Rumpus or The Millions or Elegant Variation to kind of learn about new short story writers and find their collections and see where they publish stories. Um, Best American Short Stories or the O. Henry Prize collections, they have, that's a great resource for finding out what literary magazines are out there. I always uh, recommend subscribing to a couple literary magazines. It seems really weird to pe that people want to be in magazines they've never even seen before. It just seems like an odd thing. Um, and doatrope.com is a great resource for short story writers where you can see how long a submission, the average time it takes to hear back from magazines and what their average acceptance rate is. When you see 0.001%, you don't feel so bad when you get your little rejection slip. Yeah. Um, and then I just brought a little visual aid. So when I was in graduate school, I took a class called The Poetics of the Book. I bring this to my students. And one of the assignments was to make a book out of non-book materials. So um, I sewed together my rejection slips. It actually just ripped uh, with the zizz of a page. I recognize um, some of those. Um, what did I say? And then you know, to get even more pathetic, yeah, look at Howard. You know, the rest of them. <laughs> um, so I sort of see it as a badge of pride to have submitted as much as I have, and that if you're ready to get published, you should just not write. I mean, what's the point? So I feel like you should be writing because you love writing and you have to write and you love to read and you just, that's why you write, not to publish. But feel free to kind of look at all my rejections. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> There's a whole mental attitude you have to have to, to be rejected because you're going to be rejected more than you're accepted. It's the acceptances that show up on your... And I also was going to say, a great place to find a lot of great small presses is Skylight Books. They have a lot of wonderful books by yeah. presses you've never heard of, um, like $2 Radio or Featherproof, places like that, where they can introduce... Ask, ask for Emily, who works there, and she knows a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, she's one of my students. Um, so, as advertised, I'm the slightly contrarian view on some of this. Uh, and I realize I'm, we're here supposed to sort of be encouraging you to take our classes, and once you hear me out, I don't think any of you will want to sign up for me. <laughs> but I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start with a little story, which is that when I was um, writing my first novel and people would ask me, you know, what do you do? I felt very fraudulent saying I was a writer or a novelist because I hadn't been published. And, you know, so I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm whatever, I'm writing a novel, but it hasn't, you know, I would always full of caveats. And I imagined that the day would come when it would get published and I would feel different. And that day came, and um, my book was sold, and I called my agent, and I said that I always thought that this day would make me somehow finally feel validated, and I felt no different at all. And, but the realization was that I was, in fact, a writer all the time, even before I was published. The publishing is not a badge of, of honor that suddenly validates you as, as a writer. And I always tell my students, from novel one through to novel five, you guys are writers, you're serious professionals, I'm going to treat you like writers, the only difference, I have exactly one more published book than any of you. And we go along on that journey. Because I think, to second what Ethan said, I feel really strongly that publishing is not the goal here. It's just not. It is, it's never been that hard to get published somewhere, is a fact. 
And now it's easier than ever. So if that's your goal, if that's all that you want out of this, then okay, go for it, get published, and you'll have met your goal. But I, the, the people I'm interested in working with, the people whose work I respond to, I have sort of a deep seriousness about what they're writing. And that's where I come to like the, the pee in your cornflakes moment, where I really want to say that I don't think anybody in this room should be at this panel. I think, for the most part, none of you have any business thinking about getting published, because you're probably not the state in your work yet where you can be taking that on. And that every iota of creative energy that you put toward thinking about who's going to be your publisher, who's going to be your agent, or what's in publisher's marketplace, is a piece of energy that you're not devoting toward making your work better. I said this in the last panel, so if you're a repeat, I apologize, but my first novel went through eight considerably different detailed drafts before it got into the hand of an agent, because there's nothing more important to me than getting it right. And even at that point, I feel like I gave it up too soon, and the book is, a, is sort of a flaming embarrassment to me now. But the point is, it was always about the work, the story, the book, and, and the, the students I have responded to the best and responded to me the best are the ones who have this commitment to this piece of work and they want to tell it as deeply and as thoroughly and as fully realized as possible. And the publishing bullshit comes later. We're supposed to teach in the last class, you know, in the uh, in novel one, two, and three, the last class is the business of publishing. And I basically tell my students, I'm going to talk for 10 minutes and answer some of your questions and then we're not going to talk about this. Because nobody in novel three should be thinking about publishing yet. Nobody in novel four should be thinking about publishing yet. So I'm always going to encourage everybody. It's not that I won't answer your questions. It's not that we can't talk about the process. But if you're sitting there, you know, writing down that you know you want Andrew Wiley to be your agent someday, you know, boy, you are thinking about the wrong stuff. Excellent. All right, we'll now take questions. Um, so we have a little over 15 minutes of questions. Which, which one? This woman in the light. She was the right. first one. All right. Now, thank you. Um, Rebecca, earlier you made the comment you started writing to the Pardon me, I'm so sorry. Earlier you made the comment you decided to start writing for digital. Does that mean yeah. that you changed your writing style? No, 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 no. I simply, I'm sorry, I, I should have said I now only published it digitally, if I hate that word. But no, my writing style has not changed. What has changed, and I'm very grateful for it, is the fact that I now have a greater um, freedom in terms of how I write. The, the first book I published um, on digital was a the book of my heart. I think we all have those books. And New York said, oh, we like the first person, but we don't like the third person. We like the third person, but we don't like the first person. And on and on they went. And I thought, you know what? I really believe in this book. So I, I didn't think I had much to lose by publishing it digitally. I understood my craft. I understood that this was a risky book. And the nice thing is um, that the reviews have really you know, borne out that my creative gut was was correct. So it's allowed me, I do write thrillers, I love thrillers, but there are times I want to branch out a little bit. And this allows me to do that in the same genre, but with perhaps a little more literary bent. And, and I was really grateful to have a place for this book. So no, my writing did not change. If anything, I tried to write better because I know the response is going to be so quick and vicious that people hate it. And so, I'm not good with vicious, um, but uh, in fact, my, my best rejection was the editor wrote to my agent and said, Rebecca was so intelligent in person, it's a pity she doesn't write that way. <laughs> yeah. so, anyway, no, I did not change my style. All right, Chris, right here. Um, so, you guys, you know, both on the, your, PowerPoint in, in conversation, you talked a lot about the rewriting, the editing, the going back through it. Just out of curiosity, how do you, each individual, maybe you can each give us a short answer, how do you guys know when you're, when a, both of you are working on You said you rewrote something eight times. And I mean, how do you how do you get to a point where you go, okay, I'm ready to move on? Especially if you have, say, a sequel already in mind or another book you want to move on to. So, well, first of all, I'd say if you have a sequel in a series, don't, don't rush, because if you follow up the first book, no one's going to care about the sequel. Uh, when I when I teach novel one, I do a class and revision, and we teach the, the many drafts of the first draft, and walking it very quickly through. I think the first draft, whoa, sorry, the first draft was um, what we call the spaghetti draft, where you don't care if it's pretty, you don't care if it's right, you just get something on page to work with. Then the second draft was I began to 
fix the holes and fix the problems and make it feel more like a book. Then the third draft, my theory of this stuff is that, um, you know how the Star Trek movies, the odd numbered ones sucked and the even numbered ones were good? <laughs> I think in revisions, odd numbered drafts for some reason tend to be the better drafts because in that second draft, when I was fixing things, I was also breaking a bunch of things in the process of fixing. So that third draft for me becomes then about the, the spackle draft, where I fix the things I broke, I make sure the whole thing coheres, and that's a draft that I start to show to people. A small group of people who I respect and trust to be honest with me. Not my mother, not my sister, but folks who I know will tell it to me straight. I get the notes from five people, I do two more drafts, the even number crappy fourth draft, then the fifth draft that fixes what I broke in the fourth draft. I show that to three different people who didn't even see the first draft, got their thoughts. After that, I do those requisite two more drafts. Then I did one draft that was just sentence by sentence, reading language, not trying to think sense of the whole, looking at a sentence, is the sentence efficient, grammatically correct, Does it is it memorable, does it do what I need to do, and moved on. At the end of those eight drafts, that's what I sent to an agent, and I got an agent in about two weeks. So. I'll just underscore what he said about save the, the sentence by sentence for your last draft. I see many writers you know, work on a draft for each sentence when maybe the whole chapter has to be thrown out. You know, get everything else down. <laughs> right, anyway, on to you. Um, I always say I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with a book or a story when I know it's as good as I can make it, um, which I always can make it better. So even my book that I wrote the essay about that's been rejected by a bunch of editors, there are still things that I would like to change, but at this point I feel like it's as good as I can make it, and that's sort of a very intimate question for yourself to ask. Um, I actually would disagree with the, just on my own writing process, I really love language and I love to write sentences, um, and I know that it can slow things down and not help often, but I think a lot of my drafts are quite beautiful when I, the first draft, but they're sort of like good looking paper dolls, like they look good, but there's nothing really substantial there. So I often have to go back and flesh it out and make it better. But when I go to the third draft, I have to go back in on a sentence level because that's the that's where the joy is for me in writing. So I always have to make that part of my revision process. And I'm I'm a really visual person. Like I sew and I like patterns. Patterns make sense to me. So I have a visual I use on editing that is a pyramid. My foundation has to be correct especially if you're writing a mystery or a thriller where you're using red herrings and clues and all the rest of this. If my foundation isn't working on that first draft or the first reread, then I have to go back and ask myself why isn't it working and what do I have to do to make it stronger, to make it interesting, um, so that the, the characters have a long life to the end of the book, that you're engaged and interested in them, that the plot itself is believable, and that the courtroom scenes work. So I do, I don't even read for creativity at that point in my first draft. I read for, um, for foundational work. Then the next part of my pyramid, I read for continuity. You know, did I give somebody blue hair in chapter one and they're, they've got green hair in chapter three? You know, did I forget that they, they said they love somebody here and now they hate them and there's no reason for it? So I do all my continuity work. And then the final little tip of that pyramid, and I do this many times, I usually do about six drafts. Um, that final tip of the pyramid is my creative soul coming up. How is my sentence, how are my sentence structured? And you know, what is my language? Is it too flowery? Is it not flowery enough? Does it do justice to the genre? So for me, breaking it up into a pattern really works. And I think what was said, having a group of readers is really instrumental for me and probably for other people. I have one. one yeah. group. You know why? Because I love pleasing everybody. If I have five and they all tell me something, I try so hard to get it all in there. Oh, so I have that's the I always tell so, so yeah, that's the freaking side. Idea. That's usually the second draft. Yeah. <laughs> I think what you're starting to see, too, is that there is no one way. Everyone's got their thing. I, I just don't think that no one here is mentioned, but maybe they do it. Uh, Outline. I used to be anti-outlining. That's an, you know, out, outlining seemed anti-creative. In, in my short fiction, I just would write where I went. With novels, I, I realized, hey, something could happen on page 20 I did wrong, and then I get to the end of the book and I have to throw out 300 pages. I also find my mind goes so fast. I can see a whole scene. I can I can just write little notes to myself and think it in my mind. Like, oh, that doesn't work. And I create a new scene and. I can write so much faster in my head 
than on paper. So when it all looks good in an outline, then I start writing, and, and then other things happen. My outline isn't in concrete. It, it, it changes as, as surprises happen to me. Uh, I also do one draft just for simile and metaphor. It, it doesn't come off my tongue easily, but I love it so much that I'll only do a draft looking for spots for that. Just to, I want to touch back on one thing Eden said, because I think it's germane also to your question. She raised a great point, which is that there's an inherent paradox in the so-called end, because you do have to feel like you've done all that you can possibly do with it, and yet, if you've got any kind of creative spirit, you feel like you've never done everything you can possibly do. And I think when that moment arises, it's the question of, are you setting it aside because you're just tired of it and you don't want to look at the damn thing anymore, or are you setting it aside, setting it aside because you feel it really sort of fulfills the vision that you set out for this thing? And that's sort of you know the two paths in the road. And if you can be on this path, then it's probably a better moment to put it aside. And you're going to have, as you move down through the process that Chris outlined, you will get other takes on this. You will get input from an agent, input from an editor, and you may have opportunities to go back and fix still some of those things down the line when fresh eyes come to it. So that's something to think about. Yeah, and it's a difficulty too when you, if, if you decide to self-publish or you decide to digitally publish, your safety net of that editor and agent are gone. You have that. And I have to tell you, yeah. it is scary. Because especially if you're used to having that, that person has always said, it's ready to go. Because you knew they were going to spend the money to print the cover and print 100,000 copies and do all these things. So I trusted their instinct that the, the book was ready to go. And, and so it, there's a courage element here that you're going to have to deal with if you choose to go out digitally or self-publish you know, a hardcover without having had this experience of working with agents and editors. And you can hire editors that are anywhere from about 1,000 to 2,500, but save it for last after you think you're done, because your editor's going to tell you things that will need to be worked on, but if it's just a rough draft, you're wasting your money. They can't, they can't do everything. Uh, play it, huh? <laughs> Um, Ms. Forster, you talked about uh, the reason why you moved away from traditional publishing was because they were sort of impinging on your rights and giving you lines to sign that you thought were horrific. Um, what, how do you work with those people so that you can still maintain your rights? Or you is can. it, or, so you just That's have to step it. away and go into You know, the, right now you guys are sort of on the verge, and I'm sure, I hope everybody here agrees that we are on sort of a brave new world of publishing. No one really knows what's going to happen. Um, oh, we're almost done, and, and I can talk to you after, after if you want. But bookstores are going out of business. Well, major bookstores are going out of business. Independents are cropping, cropping up. In fact, I have just been in touch with someone who is starting a brick and mortar store strictly for independent published authors, which I found fascinating. So as one thing leaves us, as one opportunity leaves you, another crops up. And I, I have to disagree with the business end of it. I teach a class called Getting Your Novel Notice, Polishing and Perfecting your, your Pitch. And I teach the business of it with the creativity because that is the way I learn. And I knew what creative decisions I made would affect what happened to it in the marketplace. Not everybody feels this way, but remember my background was business. And so, so I look at things a little bit differently. In the end, it's about our creativity. But there is a world out there, depending on what your objective is, if you want to make a living at it, you have to think about certain things. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there, but we'd love to you know, explore a little bit more with you. It's just that things are changing. This is the wild west of publishing right now. It's changing very fast. Yeah, very and, fast. Um, yeah, that I was in publishing. I, I, I was a senior editor at a publishing house. And so I saw it from the inside. So when I decided to uh, take my first book of short fiction when my agent said, you can't make money in short fiction. He said, write a novel, and, but I've got all these stories published. Why can't you just send out the manuscript? So I, I created my own company, and I do what the big publishers do, including making the you know, little copyright page with all the stuff. It looks like it. My very first review for this book was in the LA Times. You know, if you follow, what the publishers do, you can sometimes do it for yourself. Time for one more question, Becca. Um, this might be a little bit of a naive question, 
and or maybe even in the middle of Nile question, I guess. <laughs> that's quite a that's quite a stretch there. <laughs> Naive to megalomania. Yeah. You set expectations here now. <laughs> I don't really, not that I am intensely wealthy, but if I don't really care about the money, the business model, and I've written a bunch of short stories that I'm happy with, uh, are there websites that exist that are better that I can just upload the short stories to without, you know, compensation? Just, just so that well, can most happen. short fiction, you don't get compensated, period. <laughs> yeah. um, so the trick is to still get accepted there. You, you submit your work, often online, they reject you online, it's really instantaneous. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I guess my question is, who are you looking to reach exactly? I mean, are you looking to just get all of your stories out there on the web so people can check them out if they want to, or do you, are you looking for a more formally published kind of yeah, approach? Website, you... Well, I have four friends who do anthologies of those short stories digitally. They, the short story readers have flocked to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Smashwords. I also want to say I don't write for money, and I don't expect to really make much money from my writing. But I don't write thrillers, commercial. which I, I don't write commercial fiction. I mean, I think it's kind of fun to read, but I don't know. So I feel like I always sent my stories out never, with, especially my short fiction, never with the assumption that I would make money off my short fiction. But I've taken a lot of pleasure in seeing it in well-regarded magazines where there is a readership. So, not that there's anything wrong with, you know, publishing, self-publishing online or what have you, but if you are, it depends, like Mark said, like, who do you want to see those? If it's just, if you want to do all your own marketing or you only want your friends and family to read them, then that's one question. If you're really looking to build a wider readership of other um, well-read people, then I would look into the literary magazine industry and small, you know, like online magazines, like narrative magazine and the like. All right. Unfortunately, the 40 minutes is up. Uh, there is no other group coming after, so you can ask us. Also, uh, I'm selling my proof. This novel is coming out next month. If you want to see a sample of something done, 10 bucks for any of this stuff. And we should probably mention which classes we are teaching next semester for those who are interested. Yeah. I'm teaching the inter intermediate short story on Thursday nights. And I'll be teaching novel three on Tuesday nights. Uh, getting your novel noticed, preparing and polishing your pitch, I had to actually read it, on a weekend in November, just two days. And October 22nd for an all-day seminar in the spirit of it. Thank you. Thank you.